Well, God bless you. Amen. We welcome everybody that's logging on live with us tonight. We're going to have a great time in the Word of God. So try to clear out all the distractions and focus on what God is saying to you, and we believe you'll be blessed. You all ready to pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word for us in the name of Jesus. We're open to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Should you desire to flow or function that way in our, in our midst. Father, your word taught us to get wisdom and in all of our getting to get an understanding. Well, we yield ourselves to the spirit of wisdom right now. Teach us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about setting goals. As we get ready to enter into a new season and a new time, it's so important to set goals. We studied last week about vision, which is God's, um, uh, God's future for you. But specifically, we pick up in, for, in Hebrews, uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1, excuse me. And the first verse says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. He says, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tables or tablets that he may run who reads it. You know, I read the other day that a person who writes down a goal is 50% more likely to achieve it. And um, we want to talk about specifically goals tonight and setting goals. As we go from one season into the next, it's so important to set a goal when you do see the vision of God for your life. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18, there's a verse of scripture that, that, that really highlights how important vision is to your life. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law happy is he. The other day, I came across a quote by Denzel Washington. He was uh, doing a commencement address, and it was something that he said that was really profound. And I quote him. He said, take chances to dream big. Dreams without goals are just dreams, and they ultimately fuel disappointment. So have dreams, but have goals. And understand that to achieve these goals, you must apply discipline and consistency. You have to work hard at it. Hard work works. Working really hard is what successful people do. But just because you're doing a lot doesn't mean you're getting a lot done. Don't confuse movement with progress. Don't just aspire to make a living, aspire to make a difference. So I want to challenge you tonight specifically about setting goals. You know, a dream without a goal is just a dream. Uh, I would say this, that visions without goals are just hallucinations. You can have a vision about what your future should be or what you would want it to be. But without setting a goal, you could say that you're just hallucinating. In Philippians chapter 3, the Bible talks about goals and individuals who set goals and had goals. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 13, he says, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the supreme heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So notice that Paul had a goal for his life. He set goals for himself, and he even, I believe, got God's goals for his life, and we're pursuing those. As we go into a new season, I challenge you, leave the past behind. Maybe you started out this year with particular goals in mind, and you look at where you're at, 
You're further off than where you started at. Well, leave the past behind. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards the mark that's before me. And God's got certain goals that he has for your life. Again, I'll, I want you to see this because it's so true. People who write down their goals are 50% more likely to achieve their goals. You can have a goal, but if you take the time to write it down, as I'm going to challenge you to do tonight, if you take the time to write it down, you're 50% more likely to achieve those goals. Again, the Bible talks in different places about having goals, and I just want to give you these before we get into some very practical things about life tonight. In Amos chapter 5 and verse 21, in the message translation of the Bible, he says, this is God speaking to the people. He says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans, and your goals. My challenge to you is are your goals God's goals for you? When you sit down to write out the vision for your life and literally to set goals, make sure you take time to get God's goals for you and don't just set goals that you want to see and accomplish. You can have your own goals, and as the scripture said, he says, I, I don't want anything to do with your goals. What I challenge you to do is take time to get God's goals in every area. And so every one of these areas that we practically talk about tonight, we're not just talking about, you know, I want that, so let me write that down. No, don't do that. Find out what God sees for you to accomplish in this year, in this season. And you'll do it, and I believe you'll accomplish it. Let's look at another verse before we get into these practical things. Jesus himself had goals. In John chapter 14, verse number 28, he said, You heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming back. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm on my way to the Father because the Father is the goal and purpose of my life. Did Jesus himself have a goal? Absolutely. He had a specific goal. One of the goals Jesus had was the Father, pleasing the Father. The Father is the goal and the purpose of my life. In John chapter 17, he also set a goal or had a goal, and it indicates that he, he pursued those things. John chapter 17 in the message translation, verse 20, he says, I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal, somebody say the goal. The goal. the goal is for all of them to become one in heart and mind. So in, even in our relationships, we can have and set goals. It's so important. Paul set goals and he pursued them. Jesus had goals. God spoke of goals even in the Old Testament. Let me give you one more before we dive into each one of these goals tonight. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, this is also out of the message translation of the Bible. Um, he says it this way, for as long then as that purpose of resting in him pulls us on to God's goal for us, we need to be careful that we're not disqualified. What I want you to notice is that God has a goal for you. And specifically what I want to show you is that you should have a go God's goal for your life in every area of your life, not just spiritually. Tonight, we're going to look at everything beyond the spiritual life goals that we could set for ourselves. Last week, if you want to know, we talked about spiritual life goals. But tonight, we want to look at what are your family life goals for 2019? What are your work life goals? What are your money life goals? And what are your physical life goals as it pertains to your body? And not just goals that you set for yourself, but goals that God has, as the scripture says, to press towards God's goal for us. Amen? Amen. So let's talk tonight about some family life goals. Family life goals. I want to use the scripture just as a springboard for this. So I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 uh, and verse number 1 in the New Living Translation. It says this, let love be your highest goal. 
goes on to say some other things. But I just wanted to use this scripture to say, you know, the, the, the Bible talks to us about goals. How many of y'all are starting to see that? And in this particular sense, he says in your life, let love be your highest goal. So in talking about your family life goals, if you came in, I actually need one of those sheets too, uh, uh, Brother Kelvin. Um, if you don't have one of the right division forms, I want to make sure that everybody has one. But on the first level of writing goals for your family is you want to take time to sit down with yourself, with your spouse, with your loved one, and seek God's face about what, thank you very much, about what specifically you would like to see happen in this year. Let me just read you, and this guide is available online. But for your family life goals, as a married per person, where do you want to see your marriage by the end of this year? As a husband or wife, what area do you want to improve upon this year? These are questions that you can ask yourself and ask your spouse as it relates to setting family life goals. If you want one of these sheets, you can hold up your hand and uh, the ushers will, will serve you. What is, that, what is it that my spouse wants from me? What is it that my children want most from me for this year? And then what is our plan for vacations, family time, date night, for this year amen so he's coming to pass those out just keep your hand up until he gets one brother mark you can help him pass it out as well thank you so again these are just guides every family should not only have goals that they should set but they also should have a vision i got this from uh, pastor Carol. he's uh he's over our, our faith united marriage ministry and he specifically challenged us last year to sit down as a married couple and get a vision for your marriage. Just like Faith Family Church, as a church, we have a vision. We believe that we're called by God to grow, to become great, and to help others. And that's our vision statement for Faith Family Church. All of our volunteer teams, we're centered and focused on the vision of God for us, and then we pursue hard after that. Well, in the same way, your marriage or your future marriage should have a vision statement. Amen. I actually wrote, wrote ours down. I was going to bring it in and just read it as an example, but I, I, I don't have it with me at the moment. Even as a single person, you're not excluded, but as a single person, I challenge you also to set goals for yourself. Now, not every unmarried person uh, wants to be married. I, I, I do believe now, a lot of people, you may be unmarried because you, know, you had a relationship and it didn't go right. And, you know, well, I'm done with that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Amen. Well, before you throw the baby out with the bathwater, go to God and find out what he wants your future to be. I remember this, and this is true. God said it's not good for man to be alone. Amen. But some are called, no, no matter what level in life, some may be at such a place and a peace in their unmarried state that they could live out the rest of their days being unmarried. And, and even in that state, as a, as a child of God, as, as being a family member of God, you want to have a goal for yourself, for your life, for your family, and you, you want to write those goals down. I, I made a note of that as a single person, or even preparing for marriage, how far along in your preparation are you? What adjustments do you need to make? What is it that, you're, that you want for your family or your children? What do they want most for you, and what is your plan for vacations in this upcoming year. I do want to take a minute, though, to talk about two things to challenge you all as you sit down to set family life goals, and that is this. I want to challenge you before the end of this year, at the early part at the latest, at the beginning of next year, I want you to take time to review your will. I don't mean to make this a sad service tonight. <laughs> but all of us, should the Lord tarry his coming, we're all going to die someday. And so between now and the end of this year, our, my, my wife and I, we're going to sit down and make sure that our will is written out and then make sure that we get that to the attorney and make sure that it's, it's established. Amen? Yeah, we're a young couple. We're expecting to live a long time. But it's so important to be prudent about these matters. Amen? Amen. The second thing I want to challenge you to review, 
And to do it annually is your life insurance. Life insurance. Particularly as your family life goes. My wife and I, we just had two babies, you know. So we've got a two-year-old now, and we've got a five-month-old baby. And even where they're concerned, we've already talked with the life, life insurance broker, and we're talking about getting life insurance for the boys. Yeah, it'll, it'll just be, you know, pennies on the dollar for, you know, for the months, and it'll be something that they can convert in their adulthood. But it's so important. You know, which is most valuable to you, your car or your life? You wouldn't drive a car without insurance. Why would you live life without insurance? The last thing in the world you would want in the event of an untimely death is to have to do a GoFundMe in order to pay for a funeral, OK? And simply just by taking simple steps to conscientiously deal with these matters, you put yourself in a great position. I want to help you all tonight. Um, there's two kinds of life insurance. There's term life insurance, and, and I'm not a life insurance salesman, so don't get to think that I'm trying to sell this to you. But I'm helping you to understand because this is so critical. There's two kinds of insurance. You can have term insurance, and you can have permanent insurance. Now, there's four different kinds of permanent life insurance. There's whole life insurance, universal life insurance, variable life insurance, and variable universal life insurance. So it's four kinds but it's basically two types, term and permanent. One of you, it's okay if I give you all an example of when you use which, just to help you all get to think. If you take a, a young couple like myself, um, for the next 20 years, it's so important that if I were to die, that I would leave my family in a good situation. I would want my children's college paid for in an untimely death. I would want my wife to be able to live in a home that's completely paid for debt free. And, and uh, not thinking about if she would get married again and all of that kind of. <laughs> but at least between now and the next 20 years, term insurance would be a good fit for our family because we would need a larger sum of money than if I were to pass in 20 to 40 years or 50 years into the future. So term insurance is for those situations, especially if you have a young family, that if you were to die, you, you, some of you may be here and your children may be 13, 14, 15. Well, a five-year term life insurance of a specific amount, which is one of the cheapest kind of insurances that you could get, could cover them through college, I'm preaching good without everybody saying amen. <laughs> Permanent life insurance kicks in in a different sense. Uh, just so you'll know, uh, term insurance is typically cheaper than what you would get for permanent insurance. I personally don't like whole life insurance because the people that are educated in that way, they tell me that that's the most expensive kind of insurance. And, it, and it's kind of interesting in and of itself. So I have universal life insurance, and as we're looking at our coverages, are adjusting those coverages as it fits our family. Because when I was an unmarried individual, you know, the amount of insurance that I had was fitting for that situation. But now that I'm a married man, now that I'm a married man with not just one child, but two children, it changes. I challenge you, even of the simplest, make sure that everyone here, those that are listening, that you at least have a term policy or some kind of life insurance policy that can cover your burial, amen? Which is, you know, the cheapest uh, funeral that I've seen is about $6,000 at a minimum, get at least $10,000, and then let it be known what that's supposed to be used for, and you let those things be known in a will. Is this too much information for you all? All right, I'm glad that you all said that. Let's move along to a couple other things. Um, so the insurance broker was over to my house maybe about, a, about three weeks ago, and I finally understood the formula that smart people in the world that understand wealth that they use to find out how much term insurance do I need. So if you've got something to write down, I want to give you this formula, if I can find it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, so here's a life insurance form formula. Take your monthly budget, multiply it by 12, divided by 0 0.05,
and that equals what the world says is how much life insurance your family needs for your family to live without a change. For us, it's $1.392 million. So if we take our monthly budget as a family of four, and we multiply that by 12 and immediately divide it by 0 0.05, if I were to die, if we had term and permanent insurance that equaled $1.39 million, then Sister Marquita would all of a sudden be a millionaire, right? And if she put that money in account with just the simple interest bearing of 5% yield, she could live without a change just on the interest that came in from a million dollars in a bank account. I've worked for a bank, so I've seen how compounded interest works and just money that's sitting in an account, the interest generated, could, you could live without a change, okay? So if you're trying to, and, and the way we did it for us was if we look at a million dollar term policy for me and then the other permanent life in policies, uh, for term that'll cover for 20 years and you do this other permanent thing for the other period of time then it'll get you through that time where your boys would be taken care of your children would be taken care of etc let's get into some other things I don't want to spend the whole night on life goals oh there was one more recommendation so I do want to go back to that so family goal challenge is to write a vision for your marriage or your future marriage or your vision of life as a single person. Maybe there's some travel goals that you have, some other family kind of goals that you have for yourself. Write that down, that's your challenge. The second thing is review, review your will and your life insurance. Those are under family life goals. Now, let's go on to work life goals. Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, to Galatians chapter one and verse 10. I just wanna use one or two scriptures um, to touch on setting work-life goals. This is as it relates to the, any business that you own or the employment that you have presently. Galatians 1.10 in New Living says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. So as it relates to your work-life goal, make sure that your goal is not to please people. The Bible tells us that even when we work for others, we should do it as unto the Lord. And even when you work for others, you should prove your own work. If you're not pleased with it, don't expect anybody else to be pleased with it. Amen? And if they're not pleased with it, and you are, you gave your best, and your best is always good enough. Then, then be satisfied. Don't make pleasing others be your goal. Amen. So let's look at some specific things as, as it relates to your money or your work-life goals. You know, what do, I what do I want to accomplish on the job or in business by the end of next year? What changes in my work would I like to see if the choice was up to me? And how much time am I willing to give up in order to make this happen? If you find yourself trying to save your own life, the Bible says you'll lose it. But when you lose your life for his sake and for the gospel's sake, you'll find it. Are you working too much? Are you spending more time on the job than you should and not with your family? If you could change, you know, some things we wish we all could change. We wish we could make more money, right? But that sometimes getting a second job is something that you can change where your work life. Don't be forced into a situation where you have to do something. Sit down, pray, with, pray before God, find out what his goals are in that area, and then pursue them. One of the things that we're doing, and I'm using myself as an example, just uh, to be an example to you all, um, we've been prayerfully considering um, my wife working uh, outside of the home or working a secular job to earn more income. And, uh, you know, I, th that's going to cost us as a family. It'll cost her ability to be home raising the kids. It'll cost my time with her. <laughs> Amen. But, but we're, 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 when taking all of these things in perspective, perspective, these goals, we see that in a short-term sense, if she were 
to do this, we could be able to accomplish this. It'll cost us this, but we believe in the end we'll, we'll be in a better position. Amen? And so you sit down and you, you, you take time to pray about that. Make sure you get peace in your heart that what you're doing where your work is concerned is in line with the will of God. One of the spiritual principles that I taught you all last week is that when you commit your goals to God, he'll cause your thoughts to become agreeable with his will. I mean, I hadn't even considered, I hadn't even thought about her working outside the home. We're blessed at a place where she doesn't have to work. Amen. Hadn't even crossed my mind, and all of a sudden, it, this thought came to mind. What if she, and she has a master's degree in business, administration, MBA. I mean, what if she were to do this and do that? And I'm like thinking, I'm like, where'd that thought come from? I mean, it wasn't my thought, but again, when you commit your life, when you commit your goals unto God, literally, Proverbs 16, 3, it says, he will cause your thoughts to become agreeable with his will. Last week was titled, How to Hear from God About Your Future. And so we're right at the last part of praying about and receiving God's direction, even in our home, about adding extra income and what that would look like and what the season of that would be. Amen. Amen. Let's go on. We've just got two more, and then we'll be done for tonight. Let's talk about your money life goals. Oh, you'll like this. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11, there's another verse of scripture in the Bible that talks about goals and goal setting. Here it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, it says this, Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, and, work, and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Amen. So, so then it says, make it your goal to mind your own business. A long time ago, I think I preached a message called Mind Your Own Business. Now, a lot of times we think of mind your own business as it is, you know, stop being nosy and being somebody else's business. But I want to flip it, and I want to look at it from a different perspective. When you go to work for somebody else, you're minding their business. You're thinking about how to literally make them more successful at their dream and their vision. And what God says here is make it your goal to have your own business on your mind. I can tell you, God did not create you to make somebody else rich. That may be a part of your path in employment to the dream that God has, but he's got a beautiful future. He's, he's called you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And, and then when you look at it, the Bible is written to business owners, those that rule and reign and have their own, praise God. Well, you know, though your beginning may be small, your latter end is expected to greatly increase. Make it your goal to get in a situation in life where you can mind your own business, think and cause those dreams that you have of God to come forth. There's three challenges I want to give you. Um, coming up this year, early in the part of this year, um, this has happened within the last several weeks. Again, when you commit things to God, he'll cause your thoughts to become agreeable with his will. How many have ever heard of Dave Ramsey? Okay, that's most everybody. You know, he's a very popular Christian guy, but also in the financial arena, he's helped literally millions of people um, better themselves financially. Well, we're in the process of contacting their ministry, and we're going to invite them to come and have a Financial Peace University right here at Faith Family Church on Thursday nights. So Thursday nights, amen. That's, it's it's going to be absolutely awesome. And I, 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 I'm not going to spend as much time as I could spend on Money Life Goals because I'm going to invite you to attend the Financial Peace University. One of Dave Ramsey's big things is getting out of debt and living debt free. The debt is an enemy to the believer. And God told us that the borrower is servant to the lender. And then Jesus came right behind that and said, 
can a man serve two masters? You can't serve God and money. But when you in debt and, you know, when you get yourself in a position of debt, you have to go to work. Not because you want to, but because you have to, because you owe somebody else. And so I, I love his teachings. I thank God for the revelation of God that he's given. And I want to challenge you to attend. This is my money life goal challenge for you this year. Attend Financial Peace. It'll either be in mid-January or at the beginning of February. And I think it runs for nine weeks. And we're going to take Thursday nights to do it. So I challenge you for that. Second challenge I want to challenge you with is budget every month first. Now that assumes that you actually have a budget. But my challenge for you is don't just create a budget today and then don't look at it until we start talking about this again next year. How many of you ever done that? I mean, I've sat down and we've written a budget for our family, but then we go through the month and we don't look back at it. You know, I have an idea of what it takes for our family to run. I know that number. It's stuck in my mind. But are we achieving it? Are we accomplishing it? And do we make adjustments? Uh, I've heard of a, and I can teach about it later, of a zero-sum budget, and you do it at, at the end or before you begin another month. You literally say, of all of the money that's coming in, this is where we're going to spend it this month. You account for every dollar at the beginning of the month, and then you assign it, and you make it work. Okay, so we'll get into that as we get into some of the Dave Ramsey's teaching. Budget every month first. The other thing I want to want to challenge you is establish a reserve. We're going to get into some statistics later on, but most people forget about just most Christians. But most people don't have a thousand dollars in a savings account that they could go to if something were to come up. And so one of the things that, that teachers about finances teach is that at least the first step is to save. Uh, most of us spend and don't save. So I challenge you, and the big challenge is going to be to establish a reserve. Now, I do have a definition of reserve. I don't call it an emergency fund because I don't believe in believing for emergencies and preparing for emergencies. So I created something that satisfies my faith mind to help me understand what the purpose of a reserve account is and so I can achieve and, 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 and get to those goals that I have for our house. A reserve account is for when we want or need something that is not planned for or prepared for. Have you ever walked into a store and something was on sale that you've been wanting for a long time and it's at an amazing price? Y'all not gonna help me today. I mean, you're out there on Black Friday, you're not expecting this, you just happen to be going by, and all of a sudden you see it, and it is like, whoa, man. It's in those moments where you find yourself wanting then to open up a debt account in order to buy this thing on sale, only to end up paying more for it than you would have. Yeah, you got it on sale, on credit, and you intended to pay it off with 12 easy payments <laughs> with 0.0% 0 .0 interest, but we're now two years beyond that mark, and you're now paying more for that television than you could ever imagine. Amen. I challenge you, if you really want to see your life get better, apply the principles of God in every area of your life, not just spiritually. Do something naturally and it will put yourself at an advantage. So uh, a reserve account, again, is for when we want or need something. Now, sometimes you need a new set of tires, right? Uh, tire, it, they wear out. Well, when you have reserves, you can go and get a new set of tires out of that account and not be in a tough situation. And that things wear out. Things that we aren't prepared for come up, and things that we don't plan for come up. That's what your reserve is for. Now, um, there are different philosophies, and you should set a goal for your family on what that reserve should be. The minimum is a, of a th my challenge to you is if you don't have it, get to 1,000, and then make sure you keep it there, and only use it for something that comes up that you're not planned for, prepared for, and then once you drop that reserve, you've got to, you know, feed it back and get it back up to that, that, that bottom line, amen, so that it can continue to be what it is, amen? But 
for most, it's important to have at least one month expenses in savings in a reserve account. One month expenses. What that allows you to do is if something comes up and takes you out of work for a month, nothing has to change. Come on, because you got 2,500, 3,500, 5,500, or whatever your monthly income or expenses are. We use expense for us. Um, and most people expend everything they earn. So, either way. <laughs> so, establish at least one month. They say a good reserve account will have three months of your expenses set aside. And then there are even some that, that encourage six months. I mean, that may be a far off goal. Because if something comes up and you're out of work for six months, you've got something that'll sustain you without a life change. All right? I know that gets a little deep, but let's get into this last one. And then we'll close. Physical life goals. Oh, I want to back up and I want to read this. For many life goals on this guide that we're giving you to help you, and this is available on our website. What percentage or amount do I desire to give to the kingdom of God by the end of the year? How much debt do I owe? Notice this. Write down every debt, principal, interest, payment amount. Write down the detail of every debt that you have. And then also, what do I want my savings, my salary, income, and my investments to be? Again, this is just a guide to get you started in handling uh, your money business. Amen? Amen? All right, let's look at the last, which is your physical life goals. Physical life goal says, where do I want to be physically by the end of the year? How much time daily do I want to spend in exercise? Or somebody said daily. <laughs> How many times a week do I want to go <laughs> exercise? <laughs> anyway, let me activity this year. And then what changes in my diet do I want to make by the end this year? Please pay special attention to these verses of scripture as it relates to your body. Watch this. The Bible talks about having body goals, body life goals. So whether we are here in this what? Body, or away from this what? Body, our goal is to what? Please him. The Bible talks about setting goals where your body is concerned. Absolutely. And you should have physical life goals. One of the things that Paul says in a different place in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, he says it this way, but I discipline, I do what? Discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So from the pulpit to the parking lot, all of us should have physical life goals. We shouldn't just let our body go and be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. And then find ourselves in situations where we're having to believe God for healing of things that we have caused to ourselves. I'm going to share, I'm going to share this uh, personally out of my own testimony, but I want to give you one more scripture. Okay. In Proverbs chapter 22, and I want to look at verse 3 um, about body life goals. I was reading this. I was reading my chapter the other day. How many of y'all thank God for reading our chapters? Amen. So I was reading my chapter, and this was in the New Living Translation. I don't know if I've ever read this before, but it was as if it was fresh from God. It says in Proverbs 22.3, New Living Translation, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precaution. A simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. I'm very passionate about this as it relates to our body. If you are a prudent man in which the Bible is encouraging you to be, then you should be in a position where you foresee danger and you take precautions. But a simpleton goes blindly and they suffer the consequences. There is a consequence to eating certain kinds of food. It just is. And we've got to be better than the simpleton. We ought to be able to foresee. If you're constantly getting headaches after you eat that bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, <laughs> you may want to consider that there's something in there that's causing a reaction. Right? If you go to the top of the stairs and you're out of breath, 
there's something there that's telling me that you're not in the best shape. And if you foresee that as a dangerous sign, you'll take precautions. But if you keep going on year after year in the same physical condition and not making improvements, then you are going to suffer the consequences. Amen? Let me share some personal testimony before I close. We're almost done. So um, last year, I did an annual checkup. We had to go on a cruise, and my wife had to get checked to make sure that the baby was okay to go on a cruise, and so we both just had our annual. And under insurance, your annual checkup is free, okay? You might find out stuff that you don't want to find out. <laughs> and that fear really keeps people from going to the doctors. But God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. I mean, two years ago, I had to get the check, guys. That's all I want to say about that. <laughs> but I went to the annual checkup and, 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 and hear everything that I say. So the doctor, my doctor at the time, um, he told me my problem was obesity. He put it on the paper. And I was like, uh, obesity? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, well, how much am I supposed to weigh? He was like 180, 180 to 190 pounds. I'm six foot two. And so under whoever made up that chart, I'm supposed, a healthy me is 185 or 190. I'm like, man, at the time, I was 239 pounds. Well, I knew, I, I thought, I put on my winter weight, you know? <laughs> it was after Thanksgiving, and, you know, we just had a baby. You know, I put on my winter weight, and I knew I wasn't in the best fighting shape. And so I went along with it, and, and I said, well, what do I need to lose? He said, well, you need to, you know, lose some weight. I mean, and I made a serious goal to lose 20 to 30 pounds last year. I went to the annual checkup this year, and I was 217 pounds, lost 22 pounds. The doctor was impressed, very much so. Sent me to take my labs. So I went on over, and I took my labs. Hear me carefully. So I get my labs, and I call them back. And I'm like, what is this? And he says, well, come back in a month, and we'll talk about it. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Something in me was like, no, now you need a new doctor. So I get another doctor. I go back to the doctor a week later, and I'm talking to the doctor about my labs. And this new doctor, she told me, she says, well, last year, your cholesterol level was 209. This year, it's 171. She wanted to automatically prescribe me cholesterol medication because it was high. And so I'm like, OK, last year, the doctor didn't say anything at all. My, my sugar levels were normal. My, as far as I know, everything was normal when I went to the doctor. He did, I took, I took the, the labs, he didn't call me back. As far as I'm concerned, everything's great. Right. Oh my gosh. The doctor said, this new doctor said I was pre-diabetic. Not diabetic, but pre-diabetic. They look for certain numbers. They always want to ask you your family history. And there have been people in my family have dealt with the symptoms of diabetes. A prudent man. Foresees, precau for, foresees danger and does what? Take precaution. There's a reason why your doctors ask, ask you, is anybody in your family had breast cancer? Is anybody in your family had heart disease? Is anybody in your family had that? There's a reason why they have gotten to the place where they can foresee danger. I'm making an appeal to you to help you. So this doctor told me nothing about cholesterol. So one of my favorite foods was chicken fingers and french fries. I, don't, I mean, I'd eat fried shrimp. Any, I'd eat what I want fried any time I wanted. As far as the doctor said, it wasn't an issue there. Same thing about sweets. I'd eat whatever I want because the doctor didn't say anything. I don't know why they have you do the labs after you go to the doctor. So now I got it adjusted. I always ask, now I'm going to ask, 
I'm going to do my laps before I go so I can get the result. What am I saying to you? Use your annual checkup as a benchmark to check your progress on your goals. Use your annual checkup. If you don't have one, get one. And use it to check your goals. You might set physical goals for yourself, but it, you, can, you can claim, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm delivered, I'm walking by faith where my body is concerned. But if the report keeps coming back that there's something that you're dealing with, you've got to make adjustments. Use it as a benchmark. So I immediately asked, I asked the doctor, I said, what is my cholesterol? Because I, I, I said, let's make a deal. I don't want to take this cholesterol medicine. I'll come back in whatever time you tell me. Because I said, how do you get your cholesterol down? She says, diet and exercise. I said, well, why do I need medicine? She said, well, that's just what we do. We prescribe medicine if this is the case. And I said, how about this? Let me diet and let me exercise. And let me get my cholesterol down. So I don't even like fried food now. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. For my daughter, of this, I haven't had any fried food. And I know. I'm not addicted to fried foods. I like it. But now I don't even like it. <laughs> and if the last time I had fried food was the last time I had fried food, then I am done with that kind of living. Why? Because I'm a prudent man. I foresee danger and I take precautions. I'm not going to go blindly on and then suffer the consequences of plaque building up in my arteries and having a stroke or a heart attack because I couldn't control my mouth. What I mean, well, I likes that. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I mean, come on. Did this bless you all tonight? So in any sense, um, use your annual checkup as a benchmark, but then set goals accordingly. So I have a, a phys I'm going to lose another 10 pounds. I told the people in my exercise class, they were like, oh, Stanley, you look great. You know, you lost a lot of weight. And I'm like, yeah, I did, 22 pounds from last year to this year. But the doctor just told me, he put down, at 217, he put down obesity again as a diagnosis, as a problem that I have presently. Obesity. <laughs> did I stress that? So I'm going to lose. And you all watching, you all be the witness. I am going to lose another 10 pounds and I'm going to have another date with the doctor, and I'm going to talk to them, and we're going to get these numbers cleanly under control. I know it's in my mind. I'm at 6.2 where sugar is concerned. I'm going to drop that because 5.7 is the goal. That's where you want your blood sugar well, for me. You know? And so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm using that to set goals. Come on. If I got to cut out sweet tea for the rest of my life, then I will cut it out, but I'm going to find a balance, and I'm going to be better. Amen? So get those where your blood pressure is concerned, where your cholesterol level is concerned, where your sugar level is concerned, anything with fiber, anything going on in your body. You know, again, God is your God, not the doctor, right? Let God give you the goal. The doctor may say, I need you to lose 15 pounds this year. God may give you a witness to lose 10. You do what God says. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for watching us online. We pray that this has blessed you. Amen. We'll see you next time in Jesus' name. Amen.